page. So, Eamon, the, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, so, thank you very much, Thomas, for the introduction. Hopefully, I can live up to that. And thank you, everybody, for joining me. I, I guess it's good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on where you are. Uh, this is a great pleasure. And before I begin, my apologies. I was supposed to give this talk uh, last month. I had some technical issues, so I appreciate those of you who are patient and came back to see me. Uh, just some quick notes. Uh, it's very rare, but occasionally my internet reboots. If that happens, I disappear, I will be back. There's basically no math in this talk. If you wanted math, maybe go read some papers. I really want to communicate the intuitions and um, ideas here at a higher level. Occasionally, though, I will actually show you some code just to demonstrate what you can do with one or two lines of code. And my claim is that the strength of these ideas are that once you have some basic primitives in your system, with two or three lines of code, you can do a thousand really cool things. And hopefully you're gonna enjoy this, but I'm gonna show you lots of case studies to really explain the generality of these ideas. So with that said, let's get right into it. And let me talk about my overarching philosophy. So there are many ways to analyze time series data. You've heard of things like Fourier methods, wavelets, Markov models, feature learning, deep learning, and so forth. All wonderful things. However, I claim that for time series in particular, many problems, perhaps most problems, perhaps even all problems, can actually be solved simply by reasoning about shape similarity of sequences. So with that one trick in your toolbox, you can do almost everything. Classification, clustering, segmentation, summarization, rule discovery, and non-detection, and so on and so forth. And I hope to convince you of that, at least mostly, in the next 20 minutes or so. So my fundamental assumption is conservation is the key to all these problems. If a pattern is conserved in time series, there must be some mechanism that forces it to be conserved. This is true, of course, in linguistics or in music or in almost anything. So for example, let's look at um, text. Most words are not conserved in languages. Here's a couple of languages that uh, Tema speaks, and obviously the word for bicycle is not conserved in those languages. But there are a handful of words that are conserved across almost all languages. And to the obvious examples are the words for mama and papa. And when you see that, you recognize something deep is going on here. Something hardwired into brains, something in the physiology of how speech is produced, but something interesting has happened with this. This is not a coincidence. Conservation means something. Here's another example. About 20 years ago, people were able to actually sequence the DNA of many animals. And they found that the conservation of DNA between a hippo and a dolphin is much, much greater than they expected and much greater than let's say a hippo and a pig or a hippo and an elephant. And that was a huge surprise only 20 years ago, but now it's widely accepted that the closest relative to the hippo is in fact the whales and the dolphins. The conservation again tells something that we did not expect to find that's interesting, actionable, exploitable, and worth following up on. So I like this conservation idea. I wanna do this for time series data. And it means there's a small problem here. So for texts like DNA or texts like uh, languages, uh, comparison or conservation is very easy to define with equality, maybe equality with wildcards. But with real value data, of course, conservation is harder to define because two real value sequences are never exactly equal. So we need some trick to actually understand this. And we're gonna use Euclidean distance. And we can define conservation as a pair of subsequences in a longer time series that minimize Euclidean distance. So for example, in this Zebra Finch song here, or Zebra Finch, if you like, these two subsequences here actually have a, the smallest possible Euclidean distance. And once I know that, I guess you give it a symbolic label. I can call it motif one. And I can find the next most conserved subsequence. I can call that motif two and so on. And now once I've done this, I now have symbolic things I can reason about. I can ask myself, for example, are there patterns like motif one, motif one, motif two, motif one, motif one, motif two. I can ask, are these conserved between sibling birds? Are they conserved from far to sunbirds and so on and so forth? So reasoning about 
conservation in this domain and hunters in general can be very, very useful. So for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna show you a simple mapping trick just to help to explain some of these ideas. In the previous slide, I showed you the time series. And the way I found the most similar pair of patterns was, I took a sliding window here in pink, I slide across the time series, and I pull out every subsequence. And now I get lots of those, and I can reason about those as being similar or dissimilar neutrally. This, of course, is logically equivalent to taking these m-dimensional time series and plotting them in m-dimensional space. And here's a two-dimensional proxy for that. And so I can talk about ideas and algorithms in this two-dimensional space. I'm really referring back to, of course, the high-dimensional time series. So there are some special points in the space that are worth talking about and given names for. The first one we'll briefly mention is uh, time series discords. A time series discord is the point in space that's maximally far from its nearest neighbor. So if you look through these visually, you'll quickly see it's actually this point here, and it's maximally far from its nearest neighbor, maybe this guy here. And this is interesting because discords are a good proxy for anomaly or novelty or interesting patterns sometimes. We've already seen this. This is the most important pattern, time series motifs. So again, of all the pairs of points you can see here, I can ask which pair are the closest. It happens to be those two pair there. And this suggests that they're highly conserved. And as we hinted at, conservation itself is a very important concept and always interesting. And so we we'll see some other examples of different patterns uh, a little bit later today. So there's a tool we can uh, use to reason about these points in space more directly on the time series. And that tool is called the matrix profile. And it's worth explaining very briefly. So let me do that for you today. So here's a long time series, uh, length, let's say 3000. And typically we're not interested in any kind of global properties like the global mean of this time series. We're interested in small local subsequences, maybe individual heartbeats or individual words or individual days of the year and so forth. And so we're gonna capture that as I hinted before with a sliding window of a smaller length, in this case, 100. And for any time series, I can build what we call the matrix profile. And the matrix profile, if you like, is a kind of a companion pseudo time series shown here in blue. And it records the distance of each subsequence to its nearest neighbor. Let me zoom in to explain that a little bit more carefully. Let me pick a random point here, location 921. At that point here, there's a subsequence. And that subsequence has some distance in Euclidean space to its nearest neighbor. Maybe its nearest neighbor is here, or it's here, or it's here. It has to be somewhere there. And that Euclidean distance, I know, is the height of this blue curve, in this case, 177. As it happens, not particularly close. If I pick another point, in this case, randomly at uh, 378, the blue curve here by this profile is much lower. And that tells me that the subsequence here has a much smaller distance to its nearest neighbor, which is probably, you've guessed, either this guy here or this guy here. So the matrix profile simply summarizes the distance of all these subsequences to the nearest neighbor. I'm not going to explain this today, but I will tell you that you can actually compute this blue matrix profile surprisingly, maybe even incredibly fast. You might think it's computationally very difficult to do, but it's actually very fast and very easy to do relative to the analytics you want to do with this. So again, just for emphasis here, I want to point out that these two views of the world are totally equivalent. Uh, we often have better intuitions in this space, but we often work in this space. And so here, time series discords correspond to high values of this profile and motifs correspond to low values here or here or here. The matrix profile tells you by low values that there is some motif corresponding to this. It doesn't tell you where it actually is, but that actually is kept somewhere in a separate index. We can look that up in constant time. So there's a danger that this is actually going to be a very self-indulgent talk because the matrix profile came out of my lab you know, five years ago. 
And since then, much of my work has been developing this and expanding this. But I just want to mention that um, uh, it is actually now becoming uh, widely used around the world in science and academia and industry and so forth. So it isn't totally self-indulgent, let's, let's hope. So again, a quick refresher on how to read and make this profile if you see one. If you see a high blue value here, it means that the location at this point is unusual, it's atypical, it's novel, it's strange. And if you see low values anywhere, it means that that point here is conserved, that somewhere else in the time series, something looks exactly like that. So great, let's get right into a case study. Here's a problem people often have in neuroscience. So this young lady has lots of sensors on her brain recording her brain waves. And neuroscientists actually want to do analytics on this ECG, EEG data, I should say. And there's one caveat, which is they want to ignore data when this young lady blinks, because it actually throws off the measurements of the brain wave. So they need to scroll to all the data and remove the segments where she blinks. So how can they know when she blinks? There's a sensor here just under her eye called the EOG. And from that in principle, you can get eye motion, including blinks. But there's a problem, which is eye blinks can actually vary from person to person. There's no single template. And even for a single person, if I move the sensor a little bit to the left or to the right, it'll change how the eye blink looks. And then finally, even one person can often blink two or three different ways. It's a polymorphic blink. So it's actually a hard problem to think about how we're going to find these blinks and remove them from the data. But you probably already guessed a possible solution here. We don't really know the shape of the eye blinks from this noisy red data here, but we do know from experience they tend to be strongly conserved for any given person for any given session. So that suggests that we could simply run this motif discovery algorithm, find the strongest motifs, and assume their eye blinks. So does that work? The answer is yes. A single line of code, assuming you have this installed in your machine, you give simply one parameter, which is 400 here. It's your best guess as to the length of the eye blink. It's not to be perfect, but in, in the right space, hopefully. And let's see what happens. And the good news actually is that the top two motifs are indeed the two kinds of blinks this lady can do. And as you can see here, they are beautifully conserved. So having found these, we can now actually scroll to the rest of the eight hours of her nighttime session, find all examples that look like this, and remove the corresponding regions from her brain waves, and the doctor's very happy. This actually has been used now in multiple hospitals all over the world, including uh, Boston and, and so forth. Uh, it's a very nice trick people can actually use. Again, you might think this is computationally quite difficult to do, because it's about 600 million pairs of sequences that could have been the best motif. But you can actually do this in a few seconds on a laptop. It's actually computationally uh, easy to do. And just to kind of zoom in to see how this actually works, uh, here's a small zoom in of the data. And you can see it's quite noisy and complex and nasty looking data. But if I compute the metrics profile for just this section here, your eye should immediately go to the low locations here and here, because those are the locations where the motifs are. And indeed, those two motifs are conserved and they are actually eye blinks. If you go to the next lowest motif here, maybe here and here, these are not well conserved. These are kind of coincidence. So these we'd actually have to discard. Cool. So again, I like case studies. Let's see another case study where we can use motifs to solve an interesting problem. Let me informally define weekly labeled data, which is something I see all the time in science and industry. So weekly labeled data is data that's labeled, but not exactly the beginning and end of the behavior, which is what we want to find. So example of the weekly labeled data is something like between April and June, this machine broke down. So we know it, somewhere it happened, but not exactly. Or we have some machine that overheats within an hour or two of change in the infeed. So we know approximately what happens, but not exactly. So we want to go from these imprecise labels to the exact behavior of interest. And again, you might guess we can do this with motif discovery. So let's look at another interesting example. We have a bunch of seal data from uh, these uh, seals. And we have weak labels. And the reason why the labels are weak is because they're basically collected by volunteers 
paper and pencil with a wristwatch, watching these um, animals in semi wild conditions. So they can't always see them. They can't transcribe fast enough. So these labels like manipulation, moving, foraging are just approximate labels. I'm going to go from that to the exact behaviors that the seals are exhibiting. And so we can simply take this long trace with these approximate labels and slice and dice the data into just collections of individual labels. And within those, search for motifs. And there's a strong probability those motifs correspond to the exact behaviors. So let's do that. And here we see some examples. And again, this actually works beautifully well. We can check this with extra out of band data. But here actually is the correct motif or effect behavior for foraging. And here's one for manipulation. And manipulation here actually is a quite unexpectedly complex behavior. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it is beautifully conserved. This actually is the animal essentially taking a fish, which is captured by its tail, and spinning it around to eat it head first. And it's a very complex behavior, again, beautifully conserved. Let's briefly talk about anti conservation or time series discords. So as I mentioned in these previous examples, we're often interested in conserved behavior, but occasionally the opposite is true, which is why is the behavior not conserved? Maybe somehow the world has changed with an anomaly. We want to know about that. And so we can all use the matrix profile to look for time series discords. Let me show you a quick example of this. Uh, so this is the taxi demand in New York City. And you can see some obvious patterns here. First of all, Saturday and Sunday are a little bit different, which makes sense in a business region. And you have kind of two um, bursts here. One is the morning traffic jam, one is the uh, evening traffic jam, and so forth. So here's a few months of data. And the question is, how would you make sense of this? How would you just kind of zoom in and understand this? And my claim is, you can simply compute the matrix profile and use that to look at this data. So if we do this, we see a bunch of peaks. And these peaks correspond to unusual or anomalous behavior. Now, some of you would obviously know and expect, like Christmas and New Year's and so forth, but some are kind of more unexpected and subtle. For example, Comic Con is when you get you know, 10,000, 100,000 nerds basically show up in, in, in um, New York and have fun. Um, this is spontaneous Black Lives Matter march, and so on and so forth. In fact, there are some unusual things here. This actually is. Um, they are at saving times when somebody actually changed the database incorrectly and forgot to normalize for two hours, map it to one hour at daylight seven time. So this is a very nice tool to quickly bring attention to interest in days and you examine those. And so a traffic manager could say, okay, well, last year there was a traffic problem on this day because of Comic Con. I can plan for next year's Comic Con and so on and so forth. So I'll make two quick claims for this course, which are really cool and interesting properties. The first is, I believe it's the only non-detection algorithm that's superhuman. And what I mean by that is that most non-detection algorithms can find anomalies that a five-year-old child could also find if you ask them, point out what's interesting. They're visually obvious. But this course can often find anomalies that you could not find with your naked eye. Here's a data set of uh, 200,000 data points, and there's an anomaly in there somewhere. If you look at the matrix profile curve here in blue, it peaks at exactly the right place. So it has found the anomaly. So you couldn't do that. But even if I zoom in on this region and tell you the anomaly is in there somewhere, and I tell you how long it is, it's the length of the red bar, my guess is you also could not find the anomaly. So we can find many examples like this where discords find anomalies that humans can't. They are superhuman. And the other cool thing actually is they are fast. So this data actually moves at about 12,000 Hertz. Uh, and essentially no algorithm out there can keep up with that, but this course actually can, and even faster than that. Okay, let's go back to our view of these points in space and look at one new kind of pattern. So we've seen motifs, we've seen this course. Here we see a bunch of patterns that are close together, like motifs. But there's a difference, which is they appear to be kind of arranged in a manifold or a line in the space. What does that mean? Let me give you kind of one extra clue. If I tell you the time these things arrived at, January, February, March, and so forth, 
Now there's a real suggestion as a kind of a conserved motif, but the motif is slowly changing over the months. This actually is actionable because I tell you, if I ask you when November shows up, where's it gonna be? You can guess November is going to be right here, north of October. So these actually have a name. And the name is time series chains. And my claim actually is that chains are also a useful primitives to look at in some data sets. Let's see an example. So here we have a respiration data set, a uh, part of it, of a person in the hospital. And you can see some motifs and some conserved behavior. You can see some anomalies of discords too. But the question is, are there chains in this data set? And if you run an algorithm to find them, here are the chains we discover. So there's nine links in this chain. And it's actually easy to see in this space here. So let's actually look at the beginning and the end overlaid right here. And you can see that the beginning and end are quite different, but in between them, there are small steps. So from beginning, the anchor, to the first point, it's gotten slightly narrower and slightly narrower and slightly narrower. And now we actually see that the previous inspiration is getting a little bit higher and higher and higher, and the expiration is getting a little bit lower and lower and lower. So you have this continuous change that slowly builds up. And we actually know what caused this, uh, by looking at some out-of-band data and talking to some doctors. And once again, this is actionable potentially because if you can spot this chain, you can basically predict the next thing in the chain will look like the red thing, but even more exaggerated. And as it happens, it's moving to a bad place and intervention actually is required. Here's another chain, again, in a very unintuitive data set, it's hard to get some intuitions for. This is the uh, action and behavior of a small insect called the Asian citrus psyllid. It's a very important insect. It's caused about 10 billion, would it be, dollars in damage to citrus in Florida. And it showed up in California. If it is the same here, it will be economically devastating. So we're studying this very, very carefully. We, I mean, the entire community, of course. And one trick you do is you attach a small gold wire to the insect and measure its voltage or resistance between it and a plant. I mean, basically get a proxy for its behavior as we see here. And so we've run chain discovery on this, and we found some very, very subtle changes. So again, from the beginning to the end, it isn't quite obvious until I align them carefully, and you can see actually there's a small change here and here. And in brief, what's happening is the insect is basically sucking the sap out of a citrus tree, and the more it sucks, the harder it becomes because it's exhausted basically the vein, and you're seeing actually the extra effort it takes to extract from an exhausted vein. So it's a small gem of an insight uh, that we can actually uh, get from this data set. And there's one last example that I really like uh, of a chain. So here we have a nice Magellan penguin. And again, we have sensors on these guys. And so we get lots of data of its acceleration, its water pressure, and so on and so forth. And it isn't obvious we should find chains in this, but what thing about cool about chains is uh, you often find them in unexpected places. So when we ran chain is given this data set, we didn't need to find a chain. And here's the beginning, here's the end. So what is this individual cycle? You can think of it always being like a gate cycle, but obviously the animal is kind of flying underwater, not walking. And these chains actually are correlated with pressure. So as the pressure increases, then the chain begins. And so it took us a while to figure this out, but here's essentially what's happened. The penguin wants to be able to cruise 50 meters down. And to do that, it needs to take a deep breath of air. But the problem is, a deep breath of air means it becomes positively buoyant. So it's very hard for the animal to stay at a shallow depth. When it goes deeper, the uh, air is compressed in his lungs, and now it's neutrally buoyant. So it's really difficult to get down the first few meters. And this shows the increased effort and change to get down to cruising altitude. Once that cruising altitude, the chain disappears, He's at steady state. And what's kind of surprising is he doesn't do this by changing the speed at which he swims below, but changing the angle of his wings. So again, a really interesting unexpected discovery, which is made through a run and chain discovery on a data set. Great. So yet again, we're back to this view of time series, and we can actually generalize 
these ideas even further. So up to this point, we've looked at one time series embedded in the space. Well, we could take two time series, A and B, and embed them in the space at the same time and look for patterns. So A could be male and B could be female, or A could be a healthy heart and B could be an unhealthy heart, or A could be north of the plant and B could be south of the plant, whatever it is. And we're gonna embed these into the space and ask questions between them. This of course is simply the classic database idea of a join. And you can do all kinds of cool things if you can define and compute a join. So there are two cases that are interested here which are kind of opposite. The first one we call the golden batch. Here we think that the two time series should be the same. And actually mostly here they are the same. Where you have a blue point, there's some green points basically everywhere. But you might have some points that are unique to one color or one time series. So here's a green point, but there's no blue point accompaniment. It is unique to green. And the question is why? Why do bad heartbeats have this and not good heartbeats? Why do men have this and not women? And so on and so forth. The other case is I call suspicious similarity, where you have two data sets which you think are separate and should not have any common structure. And now if you actually do this trick and you embed them or join them, you find that some of the data actually embeds in the same part of the space. And you can ask, why is this conserved between two data sets where it should not be conserved? So I'll give you an example of that. It's a little bit trivial, but it's kind of fun. So here are two data sets in red and green. And it turns out there is some common structure here that was maybe unexpected. And you can ask what that structure actually is. And the answer is, first of all, here is the structure. And the structure is a little sound snippet. And it's similar to, or basically near identical to, this. So here, of course, we have um, a kind of a trivial example where someone stole a little bit of, uh, of a snippet of a song from one song and put it into another song. But actually, we've done this in other places where we found unexpected conservation that explains some hypothesis about um, transfer of energy in, in, in um, a physical machine uh, or culture operation or other kinds of things. It's a very cool tool to have in your toolkit. You would have already guessed this, but we can actually- uh, one, one question, Eamon. Uh, so how, yeah. do you, how do you produce this picture? Oh, sorry, great question. So this is not the multidimensional, um, so uh, I mean the, the two-dimensional graph. So this is not the multidimensional embedding uh, of a single uh, set of subsequences. Are, are, you, are you talking about this picture or the this actual? One, yeah, this one. Oh, this is kind of a, a symbolic. It's actually not a real embed. This is, this is a teaching aid. This is not a real embed. I'm just showing that if you do take two time series, A and B, you can think of them as being points in high dimensional space. And this is a, a teaching picture. It's not a real so embed. So it's the same. It's the same concept. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So thank you for the clarification. So you won't be surprised to learn you can actually do this with more than one time series or more than two time series. Sorry. We can have time series A, B, C, and D, and so forth. We can embed them all into some space. Again, not really embed, but simply just consider them as a join in that space. And then ask for the most conserved thing amongst all the data. So this is equivalent to asking the following question, which is this yellow disk here, I would have placed somewhere in this space such that the area or the volume of that disk is as small as possible, but I include at least one of every possible color. And the answer actually is right here. Here I have at least one blue, one green, one pink, one red. That is the uh, join, if you like, for all four data sets. And so what would this look like in the real world? Here's a simple example. Here's some data sets from an electrical demand of a house in the UK. If I zoom in, it's kind of noisy data. And so these spikes typically mean someone turned on um, an appliance, uh, or you turned on a washing machine and so on and so forth. So what I'm gonna do with this data set is I'm gonna simply divide it up into seven, day, seven uh, chunks of two days a piece. And now I have seven time series. I'm gonna join them and look for any pattern that happens in each of those seven days. And once again, it's very simple to do. 
And here is the answer. So these are the seven patterns that occur. Here I've clustered them for clarity. And so once you see this, you now know this, this pattern must be fairly important in some sense because it does happen at least once every two days. And you can ask questions about these unusual sub patterns here. I think I have especially for those. And this actually is actionable. You notice about the world. So maybe the one example of actionability is if this happens every two days and now suddenly next week it stops happening, in a sense, it's an anomaly. So you can actually have an anomaly by negation or by absence rather than a positive anomaly, which can be very interesting in some cases. So again, it's mostly a teaching example, but you can imagine taking seven or 10 of some set of things, some set of patients, some set of um, behaviors and finding those common things and reasoning about them. Once again, conservation is key. So quick a mini review before we move on. So these time series joins and set joins are actually fairly new primitives. They've only been around for a couple of years. I think they're not fully exploited, but they let us actually reason out the presence and absence of previously unknown patterns. And we can do all kinds of cool things with those in all kinds of science and uh, other kinds of problems. So before I finish today, I wanna to show you one last generalization that shows the part of the matrix profile. And this idea is a kind of a flavor matrix profile called the contrast profile. And I like this idea a lot because it's highly actionable and it takes basically one line of code. So you have the matrix profile basically installed in a system. This is one line of code, but gives you really, really cool insights into different problems. So let's see it. So in the past, we've reasoned about points that are far from other points or close to other points. Here we want to do both of those two things simultaneously. We want to find points that have high contrast. And a high contrast means that they're conserved within one color, but far from another color. So let me make that clear. Here we have a data set, and we have two different time series which are pushed into the space. And point A does not qualify here because it is far, this blue point, from its nearest red point, which is good but it's also far, this blue point, from its nearest um, other blue point. So this is not a good contrast data point. Here I have point B, and B is close to its nearest neighbor in its own color, which is good, but unfortunately it's also close to its own color, say its uh, nearest neighbor in the opposite color here, which is not good. So the point that I really want that has the highest contrast here is this point here, C. C is relatively close to another of its own color, but C is relatively far from its nearest neighbor of a different color here. And essentially the ratio of those two differences is what we call the contrast. And contrast, as you'll see, is a very actionable and useful notion to have. Let me show that with a simple toy example. Here we have two data sets, which we'll call T negative and T positive. And Negative is not pejorative here. It's simply just a comparison data set. I want to know what happens sometimes in T plus that is never seen in T minus. So once again, it might be that T minus is your heartbeat and T plus is your heartbeat after you get a, an injection of a drug. I want to know what's unique to the data that has the drug injection in it, or what's unique to the behavior of males and females and so on and so forth. So the key insight is we cannot simply ask what is in T plus, but not in T minus. And the reason is because the answer to that question is almost always going to be simply some noisy subsequence. Noise is basically always unique in some sense. So we have to ask a, a different question, which is what is conserved in T plus, yet is not in T minus? It's a slightly different question, but it makes a huge difference as we'll see. And the good news actually is that this actually takes, as I mentioned, one other code to compute because all this is, is the difference of two matrix profiles. It's the difference of the matrix profile join plus minus and the self join plus plus. So here are those two time series, those two matrix profiles. The matrix profile join between plus and minus in red and the matrix profile self join 
plus plus here in blue. And they are almost identical almost everywhere, as you can see here, whether it's noisy or whether it's smooth, but in the locations that correspond to the behavior that's unique and conserved in P++, there's a big difference. And so that difference we actually give a name to, we call it a Plato, as in platonic ideal. And Plato's are interesting because again, they are conserved in one time series, but not seen in the other. They're likely to be very discriminative. So let's see a worked example of this. We have in my lab about 100 years of chicken data we collected in parallel. So we have sensors on the backs of chickens. We have lots of chickens under different conditions. And some chickens we know have mites, uh, small parasitic uh, arthropods, and some don't. And we want to understand the difference between those two kinds of chickens. So once again here, our data is unfortunately weakly labeled. We can take a chicken, clean them up, put him in a room and we know there's no mites in him. Take another chicken that we know has mites, put him in a different room and record data. So the data is only very weakly labeled. We want to know what's different between those two data sets. And the problem is the data sets are noisy and very complex. So here's a snippet of T minus and T plus. And we want to basically scratch our heads, look at that data and figure out what the difference is. But of course the context profile, this is first automatically. So here we're running the matrix profile self-join and AB join. And we're looking for regions that have a large difference between those two. And those regions are here and here. And so these are Plato's. These are likely to be discriminative behaviors. If I pull one out here, it looks more complicated than I expected. And it wasn't clear that this actually is true. This actually corresponds to an interest in behavior, but it turns out actually that is the case. So we can search for this behavior as Plato in our data set, and we have about 12 and a half billion data points. And as an aside, I think this is the largest real data set ever searched, at least in the academic world. And so when we do this, in less than an hour, we find lots of similar examples. And look how well conserved this is. Here are the top 1,000 matches, and they are beautifully conserved. This behavior is thus baden, and in a sense, it's a really deep behavior. It's not in the culture of the chicken, it's deep in its in the reptilian brain in some sense, this behavior. It is beautifully conserved. So we could solve this maybe other ways, but this way was quite attractive because as we'll see, it's completely parameter free and it's incredibly fast. It's not clear you could do it with deep learning. We couldn't make it work. Uh, with deep learning. And even if we could, we estimate it would take about a year to do this of CPU time as opposed to uh, basically a lunch time. So here we did this by setting one parameter, but we can actually remove even that parameter using what's called the pan contrast profile. The contrast profile is so fast to compute, we can compute it for every possible length of time series. And then we can look at this two dimensional, uh, three dimensional plot here. And the highest peak corresponds to the most primitive point of the time series. So again, this is done completely parameter free and gets wonderful results. Let me quickly show you two other uses of this color profile. So let's say we're in Melbourne, uh, Australia, which I wish was the case. And we want to know what happens in Burke Street with nowhere else. So we have sensors there that measure uh, pedestrian traffic walking up and down the streets. So to answer this question of the city manager, we can get two time series. One corresponds to Burke Street. This is here in blue, about four years. And one that corresponds to a different street uh, a few neighborhoods over. We can now run the contrast profile and look for what's different in those. And the answer actually corresponds to this little peak here which is kind of strange. So we have a, normally a rise and fall of daily patterns. You'd expect not much traffic at midnight, middle of the day is very busy and so forth. But on two occasions, we actually have a strong peak late in the afternoon, uh, evening, I guess. And the question is, what do they correspond to? <clears throat> it's a bit of a mystery, but we think we may have solved it. We crowdsourced this and where the sensor was, was close to the emergency exit door for a big department store on the street. 
And basically, once they have a fire drill, people got pushed out to the street on a sudden explosion in traffic on that street. This is a very subtle pattern, and it doesn't show up in other ways, like anomaly detection, so on and so forth. So the color's profile does find this really unexpected and interesting conserved behavior. And a final example, we can actually use this to look at kind of anomaly detection. So here we have a very cool data set from a machine that has a conveyor belt that moves parts around in a factory. And people induced faults in this by deliberately basically jamming parts of this. And, and once again, we can run the um, pan contact profile. And we look now for peaks of this landscape. And peaks of this landscape correspond to an anomaly. But that's just a one-time anomaly, uh, a systematic anomaly in some sense, one that happens multiple times. It's actually more interesting in this domain. And as it happens, all these anomalies actually do have a nice semantic meaning. So all the peaks on this profile actually were known uh, problems in this space. Great. So I'm basically done. Uh, let me just briefly conclude. So we've kind of seen a tour of shape-based analytics and time series data. And all these ideas, which are quite diverse, I think, have really the one core sub idea, which is conservation or lack of conservation in data sets is the main primitive. By simply thinking about a reasonable conservation, you can do many wonderful things in many domains. And I briefly mentioned that uh, all the code data sets are publicly available. And I know a lot of people here have interest in domains and problems. If you have any cool problems or data sets or suggestions, I would love to hear them. At that point, I will uh, uh, invite questions or comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Eamon, for the very interesting uh, talk. Uh, so if there are questions, uh, uh, please feel, feel free to uh, unmute your microphone and ask. So in the meantime, I could start with, uh, with one question. Uh, so Eamon, you, you, you kind of mentioned uh, this uh, one parameter, the interesting uh, uh, subsequence length. And you also said that uh, this is not really an issue. We can uh, run the algorithm for all possible lengths. So can you say a bit more uh, about uh, this parameter? So how much, how much uh, um, domain expertise uh, do we need in order to know what the proper uh, uh, subsequence length should be? And uh, whether we can actually do completely away with the domain expertise uh, so, uh, tell us a bit more about uh, this idea of running all possible uh, lengths. So, what are the no, consequences? What are the constraints? Sure, sure, it is a great question. So, Betty's profile algorithm and generally algorithms in this space do typically ask you to give the length of the behavior you're interested in. And the good news is it's often quite forgiven. So, for example, for heartbeats, you typically want to have a length that's about one heartbeat or a little bit less. And it's quite a given. So if the heartbeat is length 500, if you pick 500 or 400 or 350, you'll probably get similar and good results. If you go much too long, 10,000, you'll probably get meaningless results. And if you go much too short, you'll probably get meaningless results. So you need to be kind of in the right space. And in many cases, domain experts have that knowledge. So in oil and gas, especially columns, people know things happen at the space of one or two hours. These are big, slow move machines. And if they get anywhere in that space, they'll probably get good results. If they go to two days or 10 seconds, they're going to waste their time. So we are relying upon some domain knowledge here a little bit. Uh, but as you hint to that, we can often remove that by simply asking for upper and lower bounds. So from a tenth of a second to five seconds, and search basically everything in that space. And that is, that is computationally tractable for many reasonable data sets. Um, not for all data sets, enormous data sets is still impossible. Um, so you can get past the length problem, usually quite easy in most domains. So, so when, you, um, when you propose to run for all possible lengths, uh, what does that mean? Uh, do we have to actually rerun the same algorithm uh, for every possible length, or is there a way to reuse computations, do it faster, 
Uh, if you can find a way to reuse the computations, I think you have a very strong paper patent. I, I'd be very, very impressed. I, I, I tried that and I failed. One problem is with text strings, if it was text strings, you could do that, reuse computations, right? With time series, because you always z normalize the sequence, the distance between two time series, when you add a point, can get larger or smaller or say the same. And so I, I haven't found a way to actually reuse computations. So what we do simply is make sure that each computation is as efficient as possible, but the reuse part actually, unfortunately, we cannot do at this point. I, I don't know how it can be done. So again, I always give people this final context. If you spent half a million dollars and two years of your life to collect you know, uh, a billion chicken points, then the difference between a minute of CPU time and an hour of CPU time, there's no difference, right? You should do the full hour of CPU time to get great results of your data. So in most cases, the effort to do this is kind of inconsequential to the effort to go into Mars, which is a lot of effort, or catching chicken data or whatever it might be. Thank you. And we, we, we have a question. Oh. Where can people find your code? Oh, great. Um, so the Metrics Profile uh, has its web page, basically. Uh, if you search for the Metrics Profile web page, it's a sub page of my personal web page. And uh, there, there are some tutorials, some videos, and there's a kind of a, a uh, little code um, snippets called 100 problems in um, time series. And so all these code samples and uh, data samples are there basically. And I should say actually there's at least 12 independent groups who've reinvented the Metrics profile almost in every language you can think of at this point uh, and different code bases and so forth. Those are independent of me, but they're mostly probably uh, as good or better than my code. Right, actually, the Metrics pro Profile code, uh, you, 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 you can find several versions on GitHub uh, as well yeah. uh, in the web. And, and there are GPU versions, there's FGA versions, specific versions, and, and so on and so forth, yes. I have a um, question. Uh, yeah? Can I ask? So, Rodica and, and then, uh, and then Reza. Uh, oh, I didn't want to cut in front of him. Uh, my question was about the matrix profile, and maybe you said that, but I joined a little late. Um, can that be applied to multivariate time series? We're sitting on a gold mine of FNIR data sets that are all multivariate time series. I'm sure that is a great question. The answer is yes. Uh, here it takes a little bit more thought and experience and you know domain expertise. You, you there are two things you could do. You could take all of it dimensions at once and make one matrix profile. And that's really fruitful because it might be that after 10 time series you have, only four or five are really useful. The rest are kind of noisy or irrelevant. And if you use all of them, you often get kind of bad results. So if you magically knew which subset was good and use only those, you do very well. So that kind of implies some kind of extra mapper or feature selection or thought about this, maybe a forward search. Uh, but all the algorithms are defined for the single dimension and multidimensional case. So the answer is basically yes. With a little bit more inspection, you can always do that. So, 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 excuse me. The same code of matrix profile can actually work on multivariate series. Uh, yes, we almost never do that. Um, we almost always basically compute individual matrix profiles, and you can actually sum them together. So even if one is in different units, if one's in dollars and one is in temperature, um, because it's in z-normalized space, you basically can send them together. So we typically compute individual matrix profiles, and then we say, well, if I take the left hand and the right hand, I can combine them and find interesting motifs in a dance or, or so forth, right? We, we can do it like this. Uh, there are uh, two questions by Reza. Reza. Uh, how are you, Reza? Thank you for the talk. I have two questions. The first question is about uh, missing values. How can we deal with the missing values? In fact, in, if we replace them by, by zero or, or a constant value, then the, this will impact the, the output of uh, massive profiles, for example, the material, sure. etc. So if you have the few values, we actually have a mixed profile that can be computed in the presence of missing values and actually guarantee no false dismissals, maybe have a small chance of false positives. So if you have about one or two missing days or one or two missing pieces, not a problem. If you have a week of data missing, you know, I, I can't help you that basically, right? If it's missing, 
but you can simply actually just remove that data, rejoin the time series and compute it. So if it's a small amount missing, not a problem. If it's a large amount missing, it's your job to fill it in or imputate it or remove it before you do anything else. More questions? Hi, um, I have a question. Uh, yeah, I, I have another, another, another question. Imagine uh, we have a group of similar but abnormal, abnormal points in the space, uh, abnormal subsequences. They will not be det detected as by matrix profile as discords, but as motifs, even if they are oh, far from sure. other sub subsequences. How, how can we avoid that? Sure. Uh, actually, I have a slide to address that, so let me quickly reshare. So this actually is called the twin freaks problem. So here's a time series, and there's actually two anomalies here. This one actually is very subtle and is unique. And these other anomalies actually happen multiple times, once, twice, three times. As you hint to that, if you do a full matrix profile with an all-to-all -all comparison, this anomaly basically cancels this anomaly and vice versa, and we don't find the anomaly. The simple thing is that when you compute the matrix profile, you only look backwards in time, you never look forwards in time. And if you do that, then the very first time you arrive at the anomaly here, you'll get a strong peak. So it's easy to actually compute, uh, to define these anomalies on repeat. You will find the first version. And of course, you always want to find the first version because the first version is the most actionable one, right? And of course, this actually also now works in online mode, not only batch. And you can do this at you know um, a quarter of a million hertz. You can do this incredibly fast and fast of average streams and find the first occurrence of that anomaly. Okay, okay. But perhaps the, the, the solution is to have a KNN and matrix profile. In fact, actually, yes. the matrix is one and n. If we have for example. Okay, so, and then you can detect this, uh, this, uh, this code. That's another good solution. I guess people might you know, criticize that um, you have to have some idea what K could be. So here K has to be greater than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, so there is a bit of a trade off there, but that's actually another good solution I use too, yes. Okay, thank you. Amon, Amon since you, you mentioned the left only matrix profile, there is a question on matrix profile for streaming data. So could oh, you say something there? Uh, sure, so the matrix profile, you can compute either batch or you can compute online. And you can compute online in a few different ways. You can compute online um, what will be batch up to that point, or you compute online, basically we'll call the left matrix profile, which basically only compares going backwards. And it's actually interesting because it highlights the first occurrence that the novelty that actually appears or emerges in the data set. So actually, I should say actually there are kind of multiple flavors of this profile, which you know we've met in our lab, but also the community has invented more generally. And you can adapt and twist for different um, problems. I know Ray has adapted it for some problems and so forth. Uh, so it's a, it's a philosophy or framework, but it definitely can be adapted by different people in different ways. Like it's you know, very nice for that. So we typically always denormalize it. But there are a handful of people who show that's actually not useful in, in very rare but important domains, and you might want to not normalize it. So again, there are multiple flavors that are possible. So I think Jessica had the question there. Uh, the, so let's hear from Jessica first, and then Tanmoy. Hi, um, excellent talk as always, Eamon. So um, I would like to dig your brain on your thoughts on the future directions of time series data mining because so I'm seeing more on um, um, deep learning based method but what's troublesome is a lot of these papers they don't compare with the more traditional um, non deep learning based techniques so it's hard to say um, but my intuition is that a lot of them probably cannot do as well, but you know, they don't compare. So I was wondering what's your thought on that? Is it worth pursuing or? No, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, by the way, briefly, um, yeah, Jessica actually is one of the co-inventors of Discords uh, 20 years ago, which is hard to believe that uh, she's not that old. <laughs> so I, I have a bit of a bias here. I, I'm 
I, I think deep learning in the context of time series uh, is not, in my opinion, as successful as it appears to be at first glance. Uh, I find some evaluation to be kind of a bit difficult to um, uh, uh, trust in some sense. Uh, we actually are working on this right now in my lab, trying to understand when deep learning can and cannot work in the context of time series. And one thing we actually found is that deep learning can be very, very brittle to small concept drift. So in other words, if you learn deep learning in a detector in the winter for some data set, it might work reasonably well, but the moment you go into the spring and summer, the small shifts in behaviors or temperature might be, would mean it would be very, very unlikely to, be able to find two positives, false positives. And almost all data sets do have concept drift, unsurprisingly. And retraining, of course, is very, very difficult and impossible to do, apart from just to be doing from scratch. So I'm, I'm sure there's a very smart person out there somewhere who will make deep learning work really well in this domain in the future, but I'm not convinced it already exists. I think it's, it's still an open problem. Um, again, I, I have a slight bias in this. I don't like deep learning maybe because I'm not very smart and I don't understand it. Whereas I think the Discord thing that we do is very direct and very intuitive and very easy to understand. And actually that alone is an advantage, right? If, if a doctor or an oil and gas engineer is shown an anomaly, at least the Discord says, well, this looks like this and its nearest neighbor looks so different. That's almost an explanation. If deep learning says that's an anomaly, I don't know why, that's very unsatisfying. Yeah. The, uh... Yeah, the lack of uh, interpretability is definitely a problem. Yeah, another great open question for someone to solve. Yeah. Thank you. A question from Tang Moi. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Yaman, for a nice talk. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so like um, uh, the matrix profile is based on the algorithm of mass, MA, which is actually uh, designed in a, in, a, in a way that you have to use Pearson correlation coefficient, and that's why you have to use the J normalization uh, to calculate the distance. So, like you don't have other choice, you have to use the J normalization if you are if you are using uh, Pearson correlation coefficient for the mass algorithm. So, again, so let me make a small correction. Uh, the first metrics profile paper is indeed based upon mass, and mass is a genius idea, which is not mine. It's by my uh, former student Abdullah Win. However, the subsequent matrix profile algorithms that are faster don't use mass. So Stomp and Scrim, for example, do not use mass. Um, mass does by default z-normalize, as you hint, and z-normalize Euclidean distance is logically equivalent to person correlation, just kind of reciprocal in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. However, mass actually allows simple variations, including weighted Euclidean distance and non-z-normalized, and normalized only by um, um, by amplitude and not mean and so forth. So mass is a more generic tool. As it happens, I just noticed that Wynn is on the talk and he obviously is the mass expert. So I, I hope, I let me, did you have a deeper question? I, I didn't, I didn't um, want to yeah. that. So, so the question is like, a, it's just like a follow-up follow -up discussion. Like you told that uh, maybe uh, there are some researchers who are trying to show that uh, gender normalism is not always the best option. Maybe some non-normalized uh, matrix profile uh, could be also sometimes useful because yeah so I, I do agree i mean there are circumstances we should not normalize i think that they're, they're fairly rare but they absolutely do exist i, I do believe that yeah. in almost all medical in almost all gesture type data sets you really need to normalize because a small amount of amplitude drift completely dominates the Euclidean distance calculations but but yes there are definitely cases where normalization is incorrect i, I totally agree with that yeah, so like uh, we are actually, me and uh, Reza, we are working on this topic actually to try to show that uh, that sometimes the non-normalized techniques uh, could be useful and like both are, the, like, both are useful, yet normalization and non-normalization also. I, so, I do concur, yes. So, uh, so yeah, so that was one point. And another point is like, we are also working on, like maybe Reza told about this KNN um, matrix profile. So what do you think about the uh, the concept or the direction of finding, because someone also talk, talk about the multivariate uh, matrix profile. So what about doing KN in multivariate matrix profile? Uh, what about, you have tried on it or you think this can be? Uh, yeah, again, I, I'm biased. I, I think kind of all variations profile can be useful and they're always special domains, motion capture where you need to adapt a little bit versus medicine versus oil and gas. 
So again, I, I'm trying to sell in some sense this profile kind of as, as a philosophy of the computational paradigm, but um, clever people in the community can definitely adapt it for different problems. And things like K nearest neighbors as opposed to single nearest neighbors, things like normalization, things like replacing Euclidean distance with runtime warping, these are all valuable sort of things to do for special domains. Absolutely. Okay, so thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks so, a lot for the presentation. Yeah. Let me thank let you. me ask uh, two questions uh, from from the chat. So, what happens with metrics profile? Uh, uh, metrics profile uh, uh, does chains and motifs. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, does chains uh, that account for motif variation in shape? Uh, could they also account for variation in time? You mean like um, time warping as opposed to? I think so. Oh, um, so yes, yeah, yeah, so uh, the uh, chains basically look at variation in shape, uh, but sometimes actually variation in time shows up as variation in shape basically, right? So you kind of get kind of confounded, uh, but you can kind of normalize those out of the way. I, I will say chain discovery, I think actually is a very promising idea. It's kind of underexplored. There's a few papers in this space, um, but not many. And I, I found that when I applied the data sets, I often find chains that are actually completely unexpected. And you go back to the domain expert, and only after some introspection, they realize, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, so that is one domain that's really underexplored. And I'd love to have more case studies and more um, community work on that. Yeah, so I guess the, 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 this is a, an open problem. And the second yes. question was, can you say a few things about uh, uh, what happens with metrics profile on uh, quasi-periodic signals or non-periodic? Um, yeah, so it is mostly useful for periodic data, uh, but we are also trying to generalize this to um, uh, other kinds of data. So we do use it, for example, in earthquake data. And earthquake data, most of the time, is just basically small amounts of noise. And it's only actually interesting when you have an earthquake. And so 99.999% of the data sense, is a discord, if that makes sense. And very occasionally you have a conserved motif, which is an earthquake in the same physical location and so forth. So it can be used in that sense and it's been used in that sense too. Okay, so the, there is a question by Jonas and then Muin, please. Jonas? Hello, thanks for the great talk. Thank you. I would like to ask a question con uh, regarding the uh, slide number 31, I think it was. Okay, I will jump back to it. Yes, uh, I'll share the slide, but ask the question. Okay, um, the, I was wondering if the, um, the discovered anomaly is indeed superhuman, so I can't verify it just from looking at it. Um, how can I know that it's really an anomaly? Is there some sort of gold oh, standard oh, oh, sure. or theoretical? Uh, sure. uh, the way we, the way we uh, talk about this actually is if we have out of band data. So we have, might have a medical data set where the anomaly isn't obvious, but a doctor is in the room and the doctor has transcribed notes. Or we have a machine where the engineer says it exploded at two o'clock. Um, so we have out of band data that, that confirms the superhuman anomaly. That's, uh, that's how. That's the only way to confirm superhuman anomalies. Out okay, of so they are they are confirmed uh, in uh, they're confirmed, they are confirmed in data. advance in this case. Yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, a question by Muin. So we're over time. So I guess that will uh, be maybe the last question. Yeah, I'll be quick. Thank you, thank you, Timis, uh, and thanks, Eamon, for talk. Uh, very very nice and excellent as, as usual. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to comment only one on the uh, uh, question Tom I asked, uh, which is uh, about uh, not normalizing when uh, using mass or when using similar research. So in, in mass page, I have a version of uh, a, a mass absolute where you do not have to normalize. It's computationally easier than uh, mass with normalization. So um, if you want to create a matrix profile without normalization, maybe you can use it repeatedly and, and produce your matrix profile as you want. Uh, so that's uh, just a small comment I wanted to make. Yeah, uh, so oh. I will, yeah, just for a discuss, like if you want, if you're trying to use mass for matrix profile uh, and mass itself, uh, what I like told that it, 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 one person maybe uses the, the Pearson correlation coefficient and that's how you formulate the 
the equation for the distance. And this equation is, is itself uses uh, gate normalization. So you cannot avoid uh, using gate normalization if you're using this equation. No, no, the mass absolute does not use the equation you were mentioning. It's, it's a different thing, uh, different formulation, and it does not use normalization by the uh, mean and sigma. So mass okay, okay. So let, let me let me encourage, um, actually, you two to follow up offline. And actually, if you want to involve me too, I'd love to listen. Um, uh, just in brief for context, I think mass, in my mind, is like one of the greatest ideas in the last couple of decades. I wish it was my idea, basically. Um, when Evelyn Fix invented the nearest neighbor algorithm back in the 1940s, she didn't actually write a paper about it for like another 10 years. And when actually invented mass and forgot to write a paper about it. But it's the most useful primitive that's kind of almost like life changing in my lab. Um, so if you don't know what mass is, I encourage you to look at Wynn's work and my work to see what it is and how it's useful. But it, it takes problems that would be computationally uh, infeasible and it makes them basically trivial. Uh, it's a really wonderful tool again. And, uh, it was a game changer in my lab. So I want to thank him in for that while he's, while he's here. So, so, so let me, before closing uh, uh, this seminar, let me ask one uh, last question from, uh, from the chat, which I think is very interesting. So, so Eamon, what can you say about causal inference uh, in time series? Causal inference with respect to matrix profile or motifs? And what are your thoughts uh, more general about uh, this topic? Um, so, uh, uh, I can see causality in two different ways. One is you have two time series and something in A caused something to happen in B. But also within just A, maybe a pattern in A is like a precursor to an eventual pattern that's going to happen in A later on. And in the second case, uh, we actually have used in this profile to try to find these precursor motifs. So basically a motif or pattern that happens before some other pattern, often a failure or disaster basically. And that's been reasonably successful. That's actually used now in oil and gas discovery by some companies. Uh, so that actually is the case. The causality between one time series and another is kind of interesting. I haven't looked at it directly. I know Nguyen has some papers on basically um, correlation to time series, which is intermittent. So sometimes two time series are independent and temporarily become dependent. And that suggests some kind of mechanism to temporarily link those, which is often causal. It could be that A is causing B or B is causing A or C independent is causing both of them. Um, so I, I'd like to look at Wynn's work for that. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you all for participating in uh, today's uh, uh, lecture. And uh, I wish you all uh, a good day. Thanks again, Eamon. Thank you all, I appreciate it. And any follow-up questions, feel free to email me offline. It's great to see people. I've uh, been stuck in my office for a couple of years, so great to see you all. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the slides and the recording will be uploaded on the Deep uh, uh, Seminars webpage. Thank you. Bye-bye.